into the pits he comes. Very difficult as a driver, you know, to judge. We had a quick glimpse of it from the stack. Oh, and fuel! That's the first time we've had a fuel splash. Oh my goodness me! This photo is iconic. It's a photo that makes it crystal clear that whilst Peril is an unwanted guest at F1 races, she's always there, trackside, front row. It captures how quickly the routine can become the life-threatening. The man on fire is Paul Seabee, a flame engulf Benetton wheelman quite literally running for his life. This is one of the most iconic pictures in F1 history. But do you know the context, the story behind it? It's July 94 and refueling is back. The FIA say this will make the cars lighter, the show more spectacular. It's lap 15 of the Hockenheim Grand Prix. Just Verstappen comes in for what should be a routine pit stop. He clears his visor, but he's shocked to see fluid. Lots of fluid. Logically, Paul thinks this has to be water spray, having been reassured by the FIA that it was impossible for fuel to flow unless the nozzle was properly engaged. But it isn't water. It's six litres of highly volatile race fuel. And the pit crew are now soaked. And critically, so too is a scorching hot F1 car that they're standing right next to, with Joss Verstappen still in it. And then this happens. Fuel, that's the first time we've had a fuel splash. Oh my goodness me. Joss is saved from serious burns by the heroics of the Benetton race coordinator. Whose quick thinking and bravery extinguishes the flames in seconds. And the fire is already out and Verstappen should not have been in that car for more than a couple of seconds or so. Testament to Paul Seabee's weapons grade bravery. Mere minutes after being a human fireball, he was suiting back up in preparation for Michael Schumacher's pit stop. Six pit crew members suffered serious burns, but that no one was killed is a miracle. The cause of the blaze? A design fault in the fuel rig. And the FIA responded in the only way they know how, incompetently, banning refueling a grand total of 13 years after this incident. 13. And in F1 history, there are many moments just like this one, where the photo takes on a life of its own. Where the story behind the photo is just as interesting as the photo itself. Like on the 27th of August 2000, going into the Belgium Grand Prix, Mika Hakkinen heads Michael Schumacher by two points in the championship standings. Hakkinen starts a wet race on pole and leads Schumacher early, but as the track begins to dry, a charging Schumacher pressures Hakkinen into a spin. Schumacher the hunter becomes the hunted. As Hakkinen begins taking chunks out of Schumacher's lead with his lower downforce setup. And on the approach to Lecun with just four laps remaining, Hakkinen dares to be great and puts a wheel up the inside of Schumi. And Schumacher responds in the only way he knew how, aggressively and dangerously late, much to the ire of Mika Hakkinen. Hakkinen had made up his mind. And on the next lap, through one of the most formidable series of corners in F1 history, he'd plant his foot on the loud pedal for a count of three. He was going to go flat through a rouge. What followed, some say, is the greatest overtaking move in F1 history. In a display of otherworldly racecraft and David versus Goliath level of brave, Hakkinen used the double toe to slingshot his way past back marker Zonta and Schumacher in one fell swoop. Post-race, Hakkinen could be seen grabbing Schumacher to have a word, and a waiting photographer takes this picture. Contrary to F1 law, this is not Hakkinen explaining how he managed to make that move stick. This is Hakkinen giving Schumacher a piece of his mind, telling him in no uncertain terms that this time he'd overstepped the mark. But take a look at Schumacher's face. This isn't the menacing Red Baron that we're used to seeing. His expression betrays the level of respect that he had for Hakkinen as a driver and as a person. Schumacher's absorbed, listening keenly, because Hakkinen's was the only car on the grid in 2000 that Schumacher genuinely feared. 
You can see the puzzlement written all over his face. What did I do wrong, he protests. This photo is so much more than just a photo. What it captures is mutual respect an unlikely camaraderie born of a shared competitive edge between the two best racing minds of a generation. Speaking of generational rivalries, none was more iconic than Senna and Prost's in the late 80s. Ron Dennis had taken a gamble and signed Senna for the 88 season. So that's Senna and Prost then in the quickest car, the same team with only each other as competition. What could possibly go wrong? In 88, the McLaren pairing brought out the best in each other, going on to win 15 of 16 races between them, with Senna going on to win the Drivers' Championship. In 89, however, things were different. Tensions grew between the pair. After Senna ignored an agreement with Prost at Imola that whoever made it into turn one first would go and challenged for the race victory. Up until this point, tensions between the pair had simmered, but by the penultimate race at Suzuka, the relationship between the two had reached boiling point. It had become clear that this team wasn't big enough for the both of them. And with Senna needing a win to prevent Prost from claiming the drivers, Prost had told anybody who'd listen that his days of leaving the door open for Senna to overtake were over. That race sent out qualified Prost by a stunning 1.7 seconds, but Prost had set his car up for the race and the Frenchman dominated his teammate early, driving the car with God tier levels of precision, unaffected by the pressures of the moment. Until Senna pitted for new tyres and began to reel in his championship rival, and then with seven laps remaining, this happened. The two title contenders beached. Their cars brought to a sorry halt, interlocked like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Prost with hands up in the air in utter disbelief that Senna would try such an audacious move. Senna with head in hands, as it dawns on him that in all likelihood his title hopes have disappeared. This moment is era defining, this photo iconic. It captures two vastly different drivers from two vastly different places, who despite their disdain for one another, in that moment, have more in common with each other than anyone else in the world. Prost climbs out of the car thinking incorrectly that his suspension has been terminally damaged. Senna manages to get going again. He goes on to win the race on track, but loses it in the stewards room, as it was deemed that he'd rejoin the track illegally. Prost then, as champion, but Senna would return the favour the following year in equally controversial circumstances. But what's endured is the image of the two Dayglow McLarens so neatly parallel parked alongside one another. This image has become era defining, it's become iconic. So we'd come to know of Senna's ruthlessness, his obsession with victory. But it was often overlooked that Senna could be as compassionate as he was competitive. The year's 1992, it's qualifying for the Belgian Grand Prix. After a 200 mile per hour crash at Blanchemar, Eric Kumar is unconscious. His car sat perilously in the middle of the track. His foot still wedged firmly on the throttle. Senna, the next driver through Blanchemar, seeing a motionless Kumar and hearing a screaming engine, stops his car and sprints to Kumar's aid. Senna cuts the engine and supports his rival's neck until medics arrive on the scene. Could a photo be any more profound? This is the heroism of Senna, the greatest driver who had ever lived, with zero concern for his own safety, sprinting across the track to save the life of a fellow driver. This was only 18 months before Senna's untimely death at the San Marino Grand Prix. And the first driver on the scene then? Eric Kumar. F1 is a story told in tenths, and most vividly narrated, in moving pictures. But the most iconic images breathe new life into fading memories. So those who come after can enjoy them every bit as much as those who came before. <laughs>